Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So I've also got another interview here at the um, Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium, and I've got Sergio Quadra. Good. I made sure I got the last name this time because I couldn't remember Seth's last name, so he had to head into it. Uh, with Fall Creek. Yes. Um, now, you may have long-time viewers of the show. There might be like two or three of you left. Um, may remember that I sat down with Ed and Susan Aller in 2011, and we had a very long conversation. I think I broke it up into three segments, and it was outstanding. And since then, um, I've, I've visited um, your newer location, your, your tasting room. Driftwood. In Driftwood, yeah. Um, I got to see them again, and I just saw Susan about about, about 45 minutes ago. Um, just got to say hi to her. So um, they, they've been outstanding people, and uh, one of the pioneers, honestly, of, of Texas wine of Texas winemaking. Um, so uh, it's it's a great honor to have you sitting with me. Um, Pleasure. So let's kind of introduce yourself to the group and kind of how you got here. And well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Sergio from Fall Creek Vineyards. Uh, I've been um, I joined the the team there in 2013. So it's been six vintages as as of today. And uh, I, I came from Chile, where I spent the previous 19 years making wines for different wineries, large, smaller wineries. Uh, and uh, a, flame, a common friend put us together, Paul Hobbs yes. uh, from California, put us together. They, they reach out to him looking for somebody. And, uh, and he said, well, I have, I have a friend from, from Chile. Is that an issue? No, I mean, bring it. So I came for a short time, um, supposedly at the beginning and decided to to stay here brought the family so now i'm i'm a texas texan by choice yeah so um i also i've not met paul hobbs but i did make a trip out to california in 2014 and i went over there and talked with the cross barn um uh -huh. winemaker his, at the time one of his wineries yeah and um we sat down and we had some a good time there so um so, and I'm very familiar with the Paul Hobbs wines in general, and he does a great job with, with his stuff. Outstanding, so. all over the world. Yeah, exactly, he and consults. that's just one of the things to, if you don't know that, um, he's not just Paul Hobbs and Cross Barn, he has interests all over, so. Uh, Cobos, Viña Cobos from mm -hmm. Argentina. Yeah. And he consults in Chile, he mm -hmm. consults in Europe, uh, he consults in the Finger Lakes. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, he's from New York. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, exactly, so exactly. It makes yeah. a little sense he, he does that. Yeah. Um, but so let's let's focus back on on you. So what got you into all of this? Well, if we go back. I, I think I had an inspiring professor. Uh, I was studying agronomy, what, what we call agronomy or agricultural engineer. Okay. Back in Chile, and I just fell in love with the uh, mysteries and the history of both viticulture and then winemaking. Uh, back then. We, we, could add, we could apply a mathematical formula to any crop and forecast what, what was going to happen with the proper you know, fertilization inputs, irrigation inputs, weather inputs. You can forecast wheat, corn, you know, all sorts of crops except wine. Okay. It, it, what I like about it, it's, it's that as of today, it cannot be modeled. It, it's it's something uh, of a human uh, uh, factor, and and of course all the variations uh, from season to season, but again the, the the human factor that 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 it's involved, it just simply cannot be modeled. So the result is always always depending on on, on you and the team on the structure on the uh, you know each each winery. Okay. So that that got my attention very very much from the beginning, and. Uh, uh, 
right after college and started working in a winery and haven't haven't stopped ever since. Yeah. So um, and, uh, kind of kind of go off the rail a little bit from wine, um, but uh, and I'm also going to adjust our our uh, little thing here. Well, we don't want to wash everything out, but. Um, yeah, we're getting a little dark there because the sun's starting to set again. Yeah. Um, I'm way too bright, but that's okay. As long as you're not too bright, we're all good. Um, so, anyway, um, so speaking of that with crops in general, so I kind of felt or noticed whatever that, and maybe I'm a little wrong in this, but say other products are made from like corn or wheat, especially things that are distilled, you don't really... Those, those products, you can't really have a sense of the place, and it's probably more because no. of the installation process than anything else. Well, you have to but, you have to re- realize th- there are certain agricultural products that that do matter where they're coming from, mm-hmm. and those are uh, the few that that get to be sensed by all our senses. Okay. So coffee. Yes. Uh, wine, of course. Mm-hmm. Tobacco. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, Let's say apples, a, ciders, a, maybe yeah, a little maybe bit. Ciders. Yeah. Um, so beers, for example, can be repeated. It can be, you know, just it's a recipe, so it's different. Right. Uh, spirits can be kind of also kind of uh, repeated. It depends on on your well, though. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's a little sense of place. Um, but uh, wine is is really something we really put all our sense, e- even hearing. When you pop up a bottle, right? Yeah, you, you, your your stomach start starts, you know, knows it, you know. So it, it's it's even five senses into it, into uh, you know, uh, assessing a, a wine. So that's that's something that that uh, we can um, apply and uh, and be you know specific into where that wine mm-hmm. came from, how it was made, from what vintage, if, if we can guess. Right. Uh, and all those, those those amazing things. Yeah, and and we, we kind of talked about off camera, but then we're not going to get to the science technical stuff. And I didn't say anything with Seth, um, but we, we had a nice little discussion about sense of place and adjustments that happen everywhere. Um, so what, and we won't go through this or the adjustment side, but I'll say the challenges of Texas, say versus Chile. Um, or are there a lot of similarities or a lot of differences? Well, I think every every wine region has challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, I not very long ago I read like uh, about a hailstorm going over Burgundy. Yes, I think it was last season. It was yeah, it was um, like in April or May. Yeah, I think it was it was in, it was in April so of eighteen. Yeah. Imagine, and it was a significant loss. Mm-hmm. In one of the most famous wine regions in the world, so every every, every uh, uh, region has has its own you know uh, problems, and we have ours. I think the the one that that it's not a problem; it's a challenge. It's the uh, operational challenge, and this is due to the weather we have here. Uh, since it's so warm during the, the summer, well, spring and summer, plants work faster. And so, in order to harvest a grape at the right ripeness, you have only hours to to choose from, not days. Mm-hmm. In, back in Chile, I could go to a vineyard and taste grapes because it, it's only by tasting grapes that, that you decide when when to pick. So, I can find a vineyard not ready and be back the next week and be fine. I'm not going to be late. And I can I can find it ready and still manage to get the next four days to pick the, the block. And so the grower or the, the viticulturist can organize, we can organize at the winery. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of timing we have, especially the the last three quarters of the vintage. Maybe the first first quarter of the vintage that, that it happens faster because it's warmer. Here, we don't have that luxury. So one day, not one week, one day, a vineyard, a specific vineyard can be not ready and be ready the following day. Okay. And if I don't pick it the, the day after, we might be a little too late. Okay. So two, three, or not to mention four days do matter while you're harvesting, while, while, while grapes are ripening. 
because of how fast their metabolism is. Okay. So that's a challenge in and on itself. So trucks, people, the winery, you know, space in the winery, everything needs to be kind of oiled and everybody needs to be like on call, waiting for the call to, to kind of trigger the, the, the cascade of things that need to happen while harvesting. Okay. Also, some days we're not harvesting. You know, some days we, we are, some we, we're not. So again, people that it's standing by. So, it, it, so the whole process of, of harvesting, because it's so warm, is a challenge. Okay. Now, the, the temperature, and, and uh, a, a, anybody would say the temperature during the, the whole season would be the main difference between Texas and probably any other wine region in, in, in the world. Uh, here, for example, we're harvesting grapes at the end of July. Um, and in the hill country, which is the center of Texas, um, we're done with the harvest in August. All varieties, maybe there are exceptions here and there, but for the most part, even the latest ripening varieties are harvested within August every year, at least last six years I've been here. Right. So that those same varieties in California or or anywhere else in the northern hemisphere are harvested maybe starting in late August, but way into October. Uh, same varieties again. See? So 30, 40, 50, even 60 days later uh, in, a, in another place. Right. And this is because Plants just follow not a clock, but a accumulation of heat kind of clock. And that starts ticking very quickly right from the beginning in, the, in each um, spring. So uh, we start at similar times. So end of March, beginning of April, every, everything is it's butt breaking, just like in, in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. But temperatures here start rising, you know, as we know. And, uh, and so we, we have a shorter, at the end, we have a shorter season. Okay. Uh, so seven months become five months here, or more or less that, that's. So now, interestingly, if you, we, we actually count heat units. Okay. Okay. They're, they're called growing degree days. Mm -hmm. So it w turns out that varieties that are harvested at certain degree days, in the West Coast, are harvested here at the a very similar degree days. Okay. It's only sooner, it, it because the, the the degree units, the the heat units, are accumulated faster. So plants just keep track of this uh, uh, heat, you know, to to develop throughout the season to be harvested at a at an equivalent heat accumulation. Uh, stage. Okay, so would that mean that um, we're still getting effectively the same physiological ripeness just sooner? Yes, not exactly. just not just you know you having a higher exactly. bricks. So so we can have, for example, we can have overripe grapes easily if you wait too long. Like I said, you have only a few days, so if you wait a little too long, I mean you're going to ruin the, the crop. And you're going to have raisins. I mean that's no question. Um, so it's it's very very important that that we spend a lot of time tasting those grapes in the vineyard, making sure that they are just getting there and to be picked at the right time. That's that's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. But that's I don't know, 85% of, of the job done is is that single decision to to be able to harvest at the at the very right time. Okay. Then we can worry about little adjustments in the winery but if you have done that first part well i mean you you've you've done i mean a lot, a lot. it'll make your life a little bit easier in the winery Absolutely. i mean Absolutely. you're going to have some years that you're going to have some extra challenges that you may have to do sure. more sure. adjustments than others yeah and and uh not to, i mean we have the the freezes mm -hmm. and we have had freezes uh that that diminish the, the crop um you know, late or early spring freezes. Um, 
uh, the hail. It's also some issues here, not not too often, but but it's it's a risk. So again, every wine region has its uh, its challenges. Mm -hmm. Now, what what I found here that it's very interesting is that uh, temperatures that we usually have during the summer, uh, July and August, even June, July and August, the temperatures that we have are considered heat wave temperatures elsewhere. So in those places, in those cooler places, when those temperatures get there, usually as a heat wave, so it's a sudden spike in temperatures, plants suffer and they show you well, all sorts of uh, heat related symptoms of being hurt by the heat. So burned leaves, especially at the top of the canopy, shriveled berries, uh, shoot tips that, that kind of burn and, and, and kind of wilt down. Um, so all sorts of heat related symptoms. And you can, you can not only tell by looking at a vineyard, but you can also taste that effect in, in the later made wine. So how come we have a summer long heat wave and the one thing I didn't find here was those were those um, heat related uh, symptoms. So when you go to a vineyard in the middle of July here in Texas, the vineyard is just normal looking, vines, green shining colors, shoot tips are happy, grapes, the, the berries are happy, everything, I mean, okay. everything looks normal despite of being under a heat wave kind of temperature for weeks. So what happens is that plants adapt early on in the spring to these racing temperatures. So by the time these higher temperatures get here, they're fully prepared. And you know what? Well, and they, they need time to do this. They need time to, to build up this, this uh, readiness, to, to build up this, this uh, mechanisms that, that prevents them from, from damaging. So the, uh, I thought, okay, so if, if they can do this, this is, this is an, an, an adaptation that they gain throughout history, you know? They, they were naturally selected to, to have this adaptation, you know? And I kept thinking and uh, realized that, gosh, they, they come from the Middle East. Vitis vinifera, the species, mm -hmm. I mean, it all began in the Middle East. So, uh, Eastern Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Georgia, Armenia, yeah. that's the epicenter of viticulture as we know it. I mean, botanically speaking, Vitis vinifera is original from that place. And, you know, I even, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you uh, 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 heard of, of this, Old, the oldest winery ever found, I mean, ar archaeologists ever found, was in, in southern Georgia. Yes. And uh, one of the professors <clears throat> involved in those diggings were, was uh, Patrick McGovern from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania University. And I contacted him and I asked him precisely this. How was the weather back then? And he responded to me saying, same as today. So there you have it. That's a desert. It's hot during the summer. I, I got temperature charts from, from mm -hmm. the area and from, from other parts of Iran and places that used to be, you know, all covered by with with vineyards. Temperatures charts that you put over over Texas temperature charts and you can't tell the difference. So Vitis again, Vitis vinifera was developed as a species on its own, without any intervention, under conditions that are similar to here. Okay. So they just had to come here to kind of remember what to do. Okay. Feeling the stimuli and triggering all these adaptations to, to kind of do just fine here. Which gives us another advantage, which in my opinion, and this is debatable, in my opinion, this this adaptation that the plants need to put in place here allows us to open the fan of varieties that we can grow here. So, of course, warm weather varieties would do well here. Right, okay. But I'm a, a, a believer that, that 
every variety can do well here. And to to have a couple of examples, we have made a Chardonnay from the northern edge of the hill country from uh, 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 Sertenberg Vineyards. I don't know if you've met Alphonse Dotson. I have not met him, no. You should. A, a, a character there. Um, so his Chardonnay was named the best white wine of the show in the Houston Rodeo in 2016. It, it was a barrel fermented Chardonnay, beautiful, nice wine. And people there couldn't believe it. It was from Texas. So, and then recently that same wine, well, the following vintage actually, uh, James Suckman gave it 91 points. Mm -hmm. uh, the top scoring wine, white wine ever on on James Suckman. So, again, Chardonnay from Texas that shouldn't exist, right? But according to mainstream, uh, you know, uh, conventional wisdom. So, I think that this temperatures force plants to do well here it's like training for a marathon i mean maybe maybe we run the first couple of miles of a, of a marathon well but then <laughs> maybe we don't finish yeah here plants that come here and start feeling the temperatures during the spring it's like preparing them for for you know the marathon that that is the, the summer temperatures and they're fully prepared and they uh, get the, the grapes right, you know, written nicely. And we, can, we it's our job to, to pick them at the right time. That's, that's the main challenge. Okay, so with, with that said, and I've visited Burgundy, Bordeaux, Napa, Sonoma, Arizona, and here. And um, I don't talk about it with every single winemaker or in Alsace, um, but with that there's, you know, there is a climate change that happens um i haven't met a winemaker that's told me no um do you feel that the adaptation that there seems to be a concern in some of the more northern areas like in Alsace, champagne burgundy that they would have to change varieties say 20 30 40 years from now do you think that the the varieties will just adapt because they'll have the time to adapt and that they maybe their styles of wine will be different but they still can grow the chardonnays and the pinot noirs the, and all that the short answer mm -hmm. is is they're gonna be using the same varieties in my, in my opinion um because what i've seen here for the most part actually now that you bring the point of climate change, uh, I'm wondering why we're not a, the, the, uh, until now, the perfect site to study other regions' future weather today. So climate change is predicting to some regions to, to increase temperatures at, 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 to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're forecasting that, that it's no longer able to, to grow grapes and or to, to do whatever. So why not to go today, today, 2019, to a place that is already hot, like I'm forecasting this place would be, to test things. So we here in Texas would be the perfect test site to do something like that. But I, I haven't heard of anything. And, See that what I mean? be, and that can be not just with grapes, with other crops. Oh, sure. Because right. obviously, with, whatever, with climate change, and, and, and I, I, haven't, I've, I haven't followed up. There's a professor at A&M that I contacted a while ago, and we, we weren't able to connect. But he so he's not just grapes, he's more of a crop scientist, and was talking to him about crops in general and climate change and how they could affect the the, the ability to grow things like wheat and corn and all that. Um, do you think other crops could adapt or maybe grapes are more suited because of the, where they came from? Well, as far as I know, th this adaptation, which which is in their genes actually, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, it's something not ex exclusive from vines. It's, it's something from the plant kingdom uh, I understand that not all the plants have it, right. but but the vast majority of them have it. I mean, it, it's just look around and all these plants need to adapt to this summer. Yeah. You know, all, all we we see here, and you know, in, in our gardens, in our you know backyards, uh, all those need to to adapt. So so, and they sometimes you find them in in cooler places, 
and do well, and they come here and do do well. So there's there's something across the board here. Um, also, um, most of the plants have the kind of metabolism, pho photosynthesis metabolism, that with increased amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, they actually work better. Mm -hmm. So uh, my guess is that uh, the more CO2 in the atmosphere, the, the more biomass is being gathered in plants. Trees, plants, you know, all, you name it. Especially wood, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as far as I know, there, there's a, a lot of buffer capacity still uh, because of how plants work. Uh, but regardless, I think that that, uh, and, and I'm surprised that, that I haven't seen more uh, tests done in places that are already hot, like places are forecasted to be, you know, to understand or to at least, you know, uh, find ways to adapt if, if they need to be, you know, ways to, to adapt. See what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, now, going back to, to, the, to the places in Europe and climate change, you know, I found something very interesting. Um, there's, there's a thing called the Roman Warm Period. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 2,000 years ago, for over like 600 years, I should say 500 years, more or less, there was a, a warm period in Rome, in, in, in Europe. And, and, and it co coincides with the peak of the Roman Empire, you know? And it seems like warmer weather up there helped every, everything, you know, crops, agriculture, everything. I can, I mean, 2,000 years ago, it was, there were grapes grown there. I'm not sure if Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays were around or Cabernets or Sauvignon Blancs or whatever, but vineyards were there. And so, and they were experiencing a much warmer weather than today. So that Roman warm period is actually warmer than today. And then there, there was another shorter period, like a thousand years ago, prior to that mini ice age in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was also warmer than today. So, and that's closer to our time. So that it's, it's about a thousand years ago. And uh, Pinot Noir, for example, can be traced back as far as a thousand years. So there, the, the first readings of real Pinot Noir is are you know a thousand years old. So you can place Pinot Noir in Burgundy in the year one thousand, okay, which coincide with that little shorter, warmer period. So I bet. I bet that Pinot Noir has undergone, you know, a, a, a moments of warmer periods. That, I mean, even warmer than than what we're supposed to be okay. going into. So, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Okay. Well, it just it just maybe that there's me. Yeah, and it, it just maybe that you Who, know, am I to, in a few decades, the wine just will be different. Maybe, uh, but again, uh, they they do adapt. Like I said. Uh, there are things that we're afraid of because they happen in a cooler place. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I can read a book, a winemaking book and that says above 95 degrees in the field, you're gonna lose color, which is to totally true. Again, a heat wave comes 95 and above and, and you see berries, you know, kind of losing color. Not only okay. those exposed to the sun, but the ones in the shade too. So, and then, and then you can make a, I mean, you make a wine from that vineyard and it can be kind of light in color. Totally true, totally um, confirmed and studied and all that. So here, we shouldn't have any color at all, according to this. So something happens. There, there are things that simply work different here because plants adapt. Okay. So plants, plants, what, what vines want to do, especially red varieties, is to be as dark as they can so birds can see them, right? So birds can eat the grape and, 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 and spread the seed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the species is, is, is safe, you know, for right, yeah. further generations. So plants are going to do that regardless. 
So they have mechanisms to do that under these conditions. And actually, they, they used to do that in, in those um, early times when they were growing by themselves in the Middle East. So um, to, to kind of go off on that a little bit more, so in, in a place like Texas, um, does photosynthesis continue at a higher temperature or is that kind of a hard, I can't remember what the temperature is, but I know it's like a high temperature that yeah. photosynthesis shuts down. Right. Uh, Sorry, we're getting a little geeky on so, this. But. <laughs> so what happens is the leaves have a little opening mm -hmm. that are called stomata. Yeah. And, and through those openings, uh, plants exchange gases. Uh, water vapor goes out. That's the cost for the plant to allow CO2 to go in. And the CO2 is then put put together into uh, bigger molecules, sugars. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, they're used as energy, as an energy source. And all that is done by light. So that's photosynthesis, basically. Okay. So there's a, a time during the day, especially between 11.30, noon to three. So it, it coincides the, the highest the sun is and the higher the temperature is that the plant, plant cannot give away the amount of water the atmosphere is demanding. So, because the atmosphere is, that's why you get your clothes dry in the air. Yeah? The atmosphere is demanding water, it's sucking water from things. That's why a pond gets dry, everything, get, you know, you know, gets evaporated, mm -hmm. right? So the atmosphere is always demanding for water, except when it's 100% uh, relative moisture. So anyway, um, so the atmosphere is pulling so hard that the plants cannot give another molecule of water. And because if it, if it does give away a molecule of water, it cannot be pulled from the ground. And the column, which is a continue, continuous column of water molecules, would break and that means a collapse of, of the uh, vessels. Okay. So that cannot happen. The plant would prevent that at all cost. So it shuts down the stomach and the, the leaves then no longer uh, transpire, that's the word. And and so hence they don't they don't pick CO2. So photosynthesis, photosynthesis as we know it shuts down. But it's because of a physical barrier that it's closed and no no more gas exchange is, is done. At that point, temperature on that leaf rises. Because the, the evaporating effect of this process, the the normal photosynthesis, it's it's cooling down the leaf. It's actually a, a like a it's like, it's like a sweating ra radiator. Yeah, yeah sweating. Mm -hmm. So um, so that no, no longer is in place, and the temperature inside the, the the tissue, you know, goes up and up above a, a certain threshold that the plants just simply give gives up. Uh, there are especially proteins that can no longer be under certain temperatures and they decompose, they denaturalize themselves and they can no longer be put back together. That's why we see burn leaves, okay? But guess what? We don't see burn leaves in Texas. I mean, I haven't seen them unless you, of course, shut down the irrigation. I mean, if you want to kill a plant, you, you can kill a plant by, mm -hmm. by not irrigating it. So provided that, that that's not the problem, plants just do well here. They they grow normally. And and what I've seen is that uh, this same process happens. Leaves get hotter, you know, but they're fine. They, these these um, uh, these adaptation we I didn't mention, but the, the genes trigger uh, uh, when they're triggered, they express proteins that are, th their mission is to protect plant molecules, parts, structures. And so that's why even though they get warm and, and hot, uh, they survive and, and they are fine. So okay. is that like melatonin for us? It helps protect our skin. Yes. I mean, it, at some point you're gonna get burned, but. Yes, it, it's like their own sunscreen. Okay. Um, so, the, the phot photosynthesis shutdown happens just like anywhere else because of this physically impossibility of the plant to give away one more molecule of water. Um, uh, but but the, the negative effects of raising temperatures within the tissues 
are not just are, are not failed and not you know they're not a consequence of of, of this uh, uh, phenomenon. So right. that's a pretty neat thing. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. So when that happens for too long in a cooler region because the plants are not prepared for them, I mean plants have the capacity to to do this, but they need time. In fact. What I've, what I've seen in cooler places, the first heat wave is the worst, but the following heat waves are not as bad. Naturally, because the plant felt it, and it, it, it kind of put, put the system in place, it triggered the, these genes, some proteins were around, and, and it's better prepared for the next one. Okay. So, but here, temperatures go up steadily during the spring. I mean, we enjoy a warm spring, as you as you know, you know, uh, starting in as as early as uh, March and April. You know, you're already fine with temperatures. Um, so plants are have all that time to adapt until you know temperatures finally reach above 100 you know, mm -hmm. for several days, right, yeah. as we know. And they're fully, fully adapted and prepared for, for, for this. It's pretty remarkable. Nice. So let's change gears. Um, let's talk about the winery and the wines that you make there. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I could spend hours listening to all this stuff, but <laughs> part, of the reason we're, part of the reason that we're talking is about is, is about Fall Creek. So kind of tell me about what you do over there and, and your, your vision with the wines. And I'm going to adjust the light again here. Yeah. There you All go. Right. So, uh, the wonders of natural light. <laughs> the sun moves, or the earth moves, really. But <laughs> um, that's right. Um, so, we we're making a, a broad portfolio of wines, uh, both in varietals and tiers. Yes. So uh, we're. <clears throat> We recently released a a new tier that had you know it, it had excited us a lot, and, and they're called Xterra. Uh, we released them in in uh, during October in 2018, and uh, there are three wines. So the story goes: uh, in 2016, we had a very short crop. Uh, we knew it. It was a uh, one of those late spring freezes. So fortunately, it was it wasn't you know hard enough to kind of peel everything or or to smash the production, but it it, it was enough to diminish the the crop. And we had a, a very short crop that year, but amazing quality. So the minute we started receiving these grapes, um, we knew that we had something else on our hands. And so as time went on and wines were made and they went to the barrels to age, we, we said, okay, if we keep doing what we're doing in terms of our wine portfolio, so same labels with these amazing wines, I mean, one, we're gonna run out of everything like, like this. Two, I mean, we're gonna give away quality here uh, and, and three, we, I mean, this is the time to make a statement for, I mean, so uh, it was that better quality that we knew that we had in our hands. So uh, we decided to, to, to um, introduce a brand new tier above everything we've made before. All right. Again, Exteras, three wines, a Syrah, a Mouvedre, and a Tempranillo. Um, all, <clears throat> all three spend like 18 months in, in different oaks. I mean, it varies. Syrah was from French oak, new oak, um, and then the Mouvedre, it's a combination of, of American and French, some, some new, some old, and Tempranillo is for the most part American oak, some new, some old. So, um, but it, they're, they're just amazing wines. Um, very, they, they combine what I believe, you know, wine should taste like each in their own, you know, varietal. Wines that are intense, uh, they are complex and concentrated, but at the same time, because with those two, you can, may think, oh, a, a, a bomb, you know, like they're elegant. So it's very difficult to have those three 
in one coming from one glass. And on top of that, I think, and this is what we started talking about earlier, is I think we can we can taste the hill country okay. in them. And and the hill country, for those of you that don't know, has in my opinion two two halves. Okay. Uh, I mean, it has a endless little valleys and, and rivers and, and hills and all that. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a large area. But y you can divide it in two halves, the northern and the southern, th southern half. The southern half, which, where these wines come from, is basically limestone. Um, so those high pH, wine, uh, high pH soils um, that are so common in Europe are all over in, 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 in the southern part of the hill country. And, uh, and, and this, this place, which is the uh, Salt Lake Vineyard, just like where the barbecue mm -hmm. yeah. is, we have this um, uh, amazing relationship with, with the Salt Lake. They're close friends, the, the Oilers have been friends for forever with, with uh, Scott there. And we, uh, we kind of go along with, with them, with the, their team, you know, following each and every step of, of, of uh, during the season of every, every grape. And, uh, and so we made these wines from, from that vineyard, the, the Salt Lake Vineyards. And uh, so that, that year was just amazing. Uh, after the time in Oak, the time in Bottle, we released them in October. We send them, uh, we send them to different places, and uh, James Suckling, uh, like I mentioned, gave them all 91 points. And uh, it was, I guess, the first time that uh, uh, one of the major, you know, wine critics in the U.S. or even the world, you know, get to taste. Uh, wines outside of the West Coast uh, in a seriously way, you know, with, with a proper uh, tasting. And, uh, and he gave us, you know, very good scores. And, and he went all the way to even post um, an Instagram post that said, uh, uh, you know, amazing American wine, I mean, amazing Texas Tempranillo. Uh, a, a great American wine, or something like that, in in, in, in one of his posts, and in, in a picture of our Tempranillo. Okay, uh, that was pretty neat. Um, and people have, uh, that have tasted the, these wines have, you know, just simply fell in love with them. So, so that it's at the top of our pyramid right now. The good news is that in 2017 we had a normal crop, so no freezes, no issues with the weather. And we had finally our normal normal crop, and uh, it was as good as, if not better, than the 16. So, so currently at the winery, we we have a follow up of, of these uh, exteras that are gonna be just just amazing wines uh, as you know as as follow ups. Right. So then we go down. Uh, we for years we've made this wine. Probably you tasted when when you were in the winery in, in 2011. Uh, the Meridus. Yes. I so love the Meridus. we're still yeah. making it. It's a it's a Bordeaux blend, um, basically Merlot and Cab. This last vintage was 80% uh, Merlot, 20% uh, Cab, from that same place where we get our Chardonnay. Okay. Uh, in the northern edge of the hill country, which is the northern half of the hill country. So that northern half is more more um, granite based. So, um, so that's that's basically the main difference. But again, you you, you can find endless little valleys through throughout the the hill country. That that's why it's so rich. It's so rich of an area to find your your best sites, your best uh, 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 track of land to 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 to, to get our Grand Cru's. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, because, because uh, 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 going back to, to what happens in Europe, you know, those famous places, those privileged sites, uh, Grand Cru's and First Growths and, uh, you know, uh, Reserves and Grand, Grand Reservas, uh, all those high-end wines from those famous places account for only a fraction 
small fraction of the whole area. Mm -hmm. I've seen numbers like 7% of the surface in Burgundy is Grand Cru, 7% only. So it wouldn't be different here. It's, it's just up to us to find these places. So the, the hill country, like I said, offers endless opportunities, <clears throat> different, different areas, different exposures, okay. um, soil depths and, and compositions, basically limestone and granite at the north. But I mean, so rich that we can do, you know, the sky's the limit. So speaking of Grand Cru, um, in, in Burgundy specifically, mm -hmm. is the hill country structured, not a soil aspect, but where mm. the middle parts of the hills are your ideal areas and versus it, the top it, and the it, bottom? It depends on the hill. Okay. It depends. Mm. But but I see where you're, where you're going. You need soil. You don't need a rock. Right, I yeah. mean, plants cannot grow in just plain rock. Although some would try, but but they need a little soil. Um, so the, again, balance that magic magic word, you know, balance. So, so mm -hmm. you, you need to have a little soil to retain water uh, just enough and to drain off the excess water um, uh, and, and some some mi minerals that are inner. You need them there. So, so again, it's 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 a it's a balance that each each hill is going to provide that at the bottom, at the middle, or at the top. I mean, it, it yeah, it, it's so varied that that I cannot give you. Okay, look for the middle of the hill. Now, it, it would be depending on on, on each hill because the erosion process here it's it's different all over the place. Okay, yeah, and so, it's like so, the coat door where there's like basically one big ridge. Right. In it. Right. They have figured it out there. Yeah. You know, in, in that that you know face, but here it's so so vast that that it, it would be. I, I expect it to be different in, in each, each each site. When so. when I visited Beaujolais, I felt like it was in the hill country, except their hills feel like they're a little bit higher than ours. Okay. Um, so when I was driving around there, and I, I didn't really ask them that question about the middle and the top and the bottom, but it, there was a similarity with that. I mean, in Burgundy, it's just one big ridge, and they, they're all, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a little different. You want to hear another cool fact? Okay. Have you heard of T.V. Munson? Yes. He saved, he saved the French. So he came among two other times you've saved them by the way yeah he, he, he has been one of the uh, non-French persons to, to get the medal of honor or some some honor medal yeah. that the French government gives to people that have contributed immensely to, to their economy or to their um, uh, benefits so he was one of them I think uh, anyway he, he was one of them um, so he came to the hill country to look for those um, native vines because the soils were similar to those in Europe. Okay. So the first selection criteria that he had. Oh, we're good on. I was just checking. Are the, we? No, the exposure were good. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So, just, so he's. My eyes are making it like it's getting darker and darker, right, but. But these the cameras camera, are good. I know. It's these, amazing. These are good, yeah. So um, his first criteria was to, okay. What do I need? So I need a plant that already grows in a soil that is similar to those in Europe. So he came to the hill country to look for them. Okay. So the first rootstocks that were around, and actually they have derived from those first rootstocks, are original from the hill country. Uh, that I didn't know. I just so, I knew that we had yeah. American rootstocks. Not only American rootstocks, but those first ones came from the hill country. That's very cool. Because the similarities of the hill country soils to those in Europe. Oh, very nice. That gives you something. Yeah, very nice. So, um, so you have so you have the Xterra and you have the Meridus. Yeah. Meridus. So then, then there's a there's another layer that we call Terroir Reflection Series. The Chardonnay's there, a GSM, uh, and we have uh, come in and out with blends. Of, of based on Cabernet as well, uh, Tempranillo. So uh, th that that comprises the the ref uh, Terroir Reflection series, and we call it Terroir Reflection because uh, we want to take take a step back, 
and think of what's in the ground, in the elements out, out there. Think of us. That's the terroir. And, and thinking of it, of, of it would be a reflection. And so we want to mi uh, mirror what's in the, all these elements into the wine. Another reflection. So that's why we call it terroir reflection. Okay. So those wines are single vineyard, if not single blocks, um, but single vineyard. So, so they're very specific. Um, and so we, at the winery, we just, you know, make them easy, traditional, not not a lot of intervention. Uh, so again, we want to have the the land to speak for itself. So, um, and then we have another layer that we call Vintner Selection Series. Uh, we have a, a chart, another Chardonnay which is standing still, fermented um, and aged, uh, a Sauvignon Blanc, a um, uh, and, and in and out with red blends. And then at the bottom, we have the classics. By the way, though, those um, uh, Victor Selection Series are coming from, from a um, uh, ABA in Texas, so it can be Hill Country, it can be Escondido Valley in West Texas, or it can be High Plains eventually. Okay. So, um, and then the classics at the bottom, the classics Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Chardonnay, Merlot, and Cabernet, and uh, Chenin Blanc, classic varieties, so that's why we call them classics, are from Texas and uh, they're just our entry-level wines that uh, you know, are at the, at the bottom of the pyramid of, of products. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the Fall Creek portfolio uh, entirely, yeah. Very cool. Um, and then your, your tasting room in... Um, Driftwood? Driftwood, yeah. I don't know why I was thinking it somewhere else. Um, how long has that been around? Uh, this last December, it, it's been three years. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been great. Uh, we planted uh, a little vineyard in the front. Right. Uh, Sorry, just this is all. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, a little Cabernet and a little um, Carignan. Okay. Which is something not very common. But... I think uh, with great potential to, to our conditions. Um, speaking of acidity, that's that's a, a, a high acidity grape. So anyway, um, no, it's been great uh, being uh, in front of the uh, Salt Lake Barbecue. Mm -hmm. It's a great location. Yeah, Driftwood is is gaining you know a lot of popularity. Uh, we're close to Dripping Springs. They say it's the wedding capital of Texas or something. Uh, lot, lots of yeah. I went to a on. wedding in Dripping Springs. See? Yeah, recently. So, so, so yeah, it's a beautiful area. Uh, you're more than welcome to visit that Driftwood location, which is again across the road from the Salt Lake Barbecue. So instead of making it to the barbecue, you take the opposite turn. Okay. Um, and and also another location we have the the original winery where you were in Tau, Texas, which is 20 minutes to the east of Llano, in, in the Llano County. Right, yeah. Uh, northwest shore of Lake Buchanan. That's another option to, to visit. Yeah, a little our, bit farther north of where we're actually at in Horseshoe yes. Bay. Yes. Separate lake, but yeah. And now the, the lakes are full, uh, finally, yes. you know. We got have, have, uh, the lakes are it's gorgeous, gorgeous sunsets and, and, yeah. and views, and so it's pretty nice and, uh, yeah. Come, come around. It's awesome. Well, um, we're going to wrap things up because I actually have another appointment, not another interview, but I have another appointment. Um, and um, uh, and it is starting to fade a little bit. I mean, it may, so I haven't figured out. I'm using my phone like I did in Burgundy. And I'm always amazed at how great. well. I mean, it's not even like. I, mean, I, I look down here because I have my iPad. My iPad is controlling the phone. I'm using an app called Filmic Pro. And there's um, a microphone here. There's a microphone here. I got this going. And we don't have the labs on. I'll, I'll take care of it. And um, because for some reason, only one input was working. And the whole reason I have this is so I can do multiple inputs. And unfortunately with Seth, apologies to Seth. I never hit record on this, but it's recording this time. Hopefully. Yeah, no, it is. It, 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 <laughs> it, it's recording. Okay. Um, but um, so that's, that's the setup I got going on here. But um, 
anyway, yeah, we're we're definitely gonna wrap this up, but it's been a pleasure. Oh, absolute pleasure to sit down and talk with you. Um, and and like I could geek out as far as long as as long as we keep things simple on on, on the technical things. Um, Try to. You know, I mean, we're not gonna go through the actual chemical stuff. Yeah. When they start, you start giving me formulas. I'm like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, it's been a pleasure to geek out with you and talk about really about okay. about the agronomy because um, you know that was part of your background there yeah. and um, you know and, and all that so uh, and uh, um, I'm sure I'll make it up I don't know if I'll make it to Tau anytime soon but you know up to Driftwood let us know yeah. up to Driftwood I'm sure I'll be up there again soon sure and uh, have some more wine but it's been a pleasure hey um, Mark nice to meet you and, yeah. and yes thank absolute you. pleasure to sit down with you thank you so much oh, for spending some time with me my pleasure um, so folks like I said we're gonna wrap it up so I want to thank everyone for stopping by click the links above to friend me up click the link over there if you want to throw a little ducats uh, and also have a link for uh, Fall Creek and um, yeah other than that um, you probably already seen the recap video because the recap video of the symposium should have been before the two interviews but um, if not look for some more stuff cocktail conference I don't know if it's going to be before or after the interviews so we got the Santo cocktail conference to go to and I've lost my voice somehow <laughs> I don't know you know, what, you know what frustrates me about this I took the allergy medicine today thinking that I might have to counteract any allergy things and I think it may have messed me up so anyway you never know <laughs> Anyway, thank you all for stopping by, and we'll see everyone again next time.